Okay, so we have talked about uh, uh, the what is risk, what is threat, what is opportunity, then uh, 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 what is the risk appetite, risk threshold, uh, uh, risk uh, 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 tolerance, and then we talked about uh, three types of risk appetites, risk seeking, risk neutral, risk averse, and, and was, we talked about the business risk and the project risk. That's it. We talked about all of these things. Now, let us talk about how do you develop your risk management approach. In the beginning of the project, naturally, you cannot define your risk approach before you plan, right? So it is not something which can be done in initiation. But I must tell you, the identification of risk has already happened, already happened even before the project started. You see, when the business analyst was analyzing the business case and he was developing the business case, he could have identified some of the risks which will be inherited to you. But as you are more closer to the things as a project manager, you will have larger understanding of what can happen to your project and you can identify more of risks there and therefore you are in a better position to develop your own risk management strategy. I also told you that there might be some guidance from the organizational governance about how should you develop your risk management approach. So naturally you have to abide by whatever the organizational uh, uh, risk management governance says about it. So you will uh, respect that, but you know, that will not be very restrictive, but that will at least draw the boundaries within which you can develop your risk management approach. Now, risk management approach is going to be a little more detailed. As I said, project manager can see more than anyone else. So you have to look at, uh, first you develop some kind of an initial strategy in the beginning, in the beginning of the planning, and actually looking at the governance guidelines and um, whatever risks have been identified with the business analyst or the sponsor, you will have an initial strategy in mind. But then, uh, because risk is an uncertainty, and it evolves over time, new uncertainties may arise. So you are free to, you know, tweak your risk management strategy uh, along, um, um, uh, along the project goes. So you keep defining, you define it first, and then you keep refining until the end of the project. Same goes with the identification and processing of risk. You identify the risks as many as you can, and naturally, you could not have identified all the possible risks which were not even possible to know at that point in time. So while the project is going on, new risks may surface and you can identify them, you can put them in the risk register and you can do their analysis and all on the go. Well, what are the factors in project, uh, in project characteristics? Uh, for that uh, uh, identification of risk or development of a strategy. What is the size of your project? Larger the size, more riskier it might be. If the project is more complex, maybe it is not big in size, but it is more complex, there is a, a lot of complexity in it, then it gives rise to risk. It is a very important project. Naturally, there will be uh, you will be more careful about identifying even smallest of risk. And what is your development approach? Are you going through uh, uh, going to use the iterative or agile method? Are you are going to use the predictive method? Because in a predictive matter, method, you will try to identify as many risks in the whole project right from the beginning. But naturally, that process goes on till the end of the project. But in agile, you will only look at very high level risks while you are doing the product roadmap. And later, you will only concentrate on your iteration and go in detail identification of risk and processing of risk uh, within that iteration. You don't have to uh, identify risks for the future. 
for the future iterations. Yes, of course, the outline planning, which is which was happening in the product backlog, uh, when the new requirements are being added, new user stories are being added, product owner will be responsible for looking at the high level risks and adding or subtracting them from the product roadmap. I must tell you that just like the requirements of the project, product owner can add a high level risk as a user story in the product backlog, right? So risk could also be user stories. Okay, then once you have developed this strategy, naturally this strategy is going to be part of your risk management plan. A risk management plan is the key document, just like we have a schedule management plan, we have a scope management plan, requirements management plan, cost management plan. So this risk management plan is also one of the uh, important plans. And as you understand, these management plans are not the details, but these are the uh, specific guidelines for this project. How are we going to, uh, what are we going to do with the risk man, with the risk in this, in this project? So in a risk management plan, what you could talk about, you could, you could provide uh, certain guidelines about the, naturally the strategy you have chosen, the methodology which you are using and how are you going to identify the risks in this specific project, what will be the different roles and responsibilities of your uh, team members or stakeholders uh, as regard to risk management, who will, be, who will be the risk owner, who will be uh, the action owner and I'll talk about those. Uh, funding, because naturally there is uh, money to be spent which uh, on the risk, on the management of risk. So what, uh, uh, how much allocation of funding is there, like reserves and contingencies? Uh, what are generally the timings of risk? When a risk can occur, right? Naturally, you can't really say when a risk will occur, but at least you have a certain limit that this risk is uh, during a specific activity and this, uh, this thing may not be a risk if it continues. For example, if it is raining, you probably can't construct, right? So naturally, if it is raining after the construction or before the construction, that might not be the risk, but only during the time the uh, it is raining during the uh, activity. So there is a timing for every risk. You have to identify that, you have to put a rule on that. Risk categories, how do you categorize risk in different you know, sections? and then try to address them accordingly. Uh, like, you know, probably we have talked about the compliance and we said there are risks to the compliance when you are trying to uh, comply with the organizational or uh, environmental requirement, uh, there are risks to that. And that is a special category of risks, which are not specifically the project risk, but they are risks to the environment, they risk to other things. They have to be also catered for. Uh, appetite, as we have uh, looked at, what is appetite? So we have to understand, uh, naturally, it is not only our bosses or uh, the customer who dictates what the risk appetite would be, but all the stakeholders, because they have got some stakes and they have interest in the project. So we have to understand their risk appetite as well. And then we have to somehow consolidate the appetite and we have to agree on a level of risk appetite which we can take in this project. Then we have to define uh, the probability and impact, uh, I mean the risk, what is the probability levels of the risk and what are the impacts of the risk. I'll, I'll go into detail about these and then you develop a probability and impact matrix. So that matrix design is developed during the risk management plan, although uh, you will do all this exercise later when the risks are identified and they are analyzed and all that. What will be the reporting formats for, for various things to report about the risk and how are we going to track these documents? So these are some of the details you could have in your risk management plan. Okay, uh, this diagram probably a similar diagram we might have seen earlier as well, but you see, uh, we are looking at it from the uh, from the risk point of view here, uh, we have our diagram uh, on the x-axis, we have technology. Technology is becoming, uh, is going from 
uh, close to certainty to far from certainty and requirements on the y axis are going from close to agreement to far from agreement right in the green zone if you are in in the green zone uh, that is usually the case with the predictive project management planning where you know you know what to do and we have almost uh, our agreement with the customer and, uh, and it is not likely to change much so this is the matter which could easily be handled for a predictive project and therefore this is called a simple 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 uh, case and there, there the risk risk is minimum in a simple environment as we start moving towards complication in technology and certainty in the project starts uh, more towards uncertainty as i mean say as the uncertainty increases and as the requirements become more complex and uh, into the area where we do not really have everything in agreement with the customer or the stakeholders uh, this we are getting into a complicated area complicated zone and such a zone can be dealt with adaptive planning or agile project management well you can use uh, on the border of the green and the golden uh, you can use the hybrid method as well but when the things become even more complex right you know we are far from agreement and we are far from certainty so that would be the area which is complex this is a, a high risk area uh, we should be handling this with a lot of care although we can still use adaptive planning or agile method for complex situations or complex project but that is a risky area and naturally we should be aware that if things are getting more chaotic in nature then probably even adaptive planning can't handle it so as soon as we enter into the chaotic zone that is fundamentally risky that is high risk zone and it is highly recommended that no project should be done if project is so risky if it is far from uncertainty and far from agreement and you know this is the extreme probably you should, if even if you are doing a project and that project enters into a chaotic zone you should uh, seriously consider uh, suggesting to close down this project this is going to be very expensive okay i uh, i think it is fatma trying to join but it's a different name hello fatma is it you yes fatma yeah you came with a new name today fatma good morning hi good morning yeah so uh, you came with a good uh, new name today pasai secretary yeah oh so sorry like that. <laughs> i came with another name <laughs> no, no problem no problem at all thank you <clears throat> so that's why like you know, I was waiting and I was thinking that um <clears throat> yeah the class is not started no no actually we didn't know who this is so I thought <laughs> maybe maybe it is you yeah oh, <laughs> okay then uh, if uh, we have uh, we have decided on uh, the level of complexity our project is going to be in then the next thing we have to decide is uh, what are the techniques we would be using for risk identification right naturally this is going to be there in the risk management plan and we would uh, actually be doing this exercise after uh, the risk management plan has been developed and created well uh, data gathering and analysis that is happening in during during the risk identification and what are the various techniques we could be using we could be using a tool which is called risk breakdown structure it is just like a work breakdown structure or a organizational breakdown structure it starts with something on top and then it breaks down into further level so a risk breakdown structure is for example the highest level is the project risk project risk could be divided into say 3 4 or 5 categories 
So they, they, it would be broken down into these categories and each category can further be broken down into subcategories and then for, and, uh, naturally under the, those subcategories, you could start identifying your uh, specific risks. So risk breakdown structure, if you uh, really want to look at it, just a moment. So you can see here the risk manager risk breakdown structure is a hierarchical representation of potential sources of risk. And then what we have other tools, uh, we could have uh, uh, we could have brainstorming. We already know brainstorming is used for creative purposes. Where we have to. Uh, it is just I I explained to you. It is just not a meeting. Brainstorming is when we are not thinking from logical perspective but from a creative perspective you are thinking out of the box creating uh, thinking out of the box is a very good way of looking at things which are which don't you don't know uh, if they can happen so you have to be creative you have to uh, think beyond logic so brainstorming could be a great tool for that then we have got a nominal group technique we have got the SWOT analysis well SWOT analysis is very common you might have known about it we might have discussed about it SWOT stands for strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats so uh, well we can do it at the strategic level we can do it at the personal level at the team level at whatever level you want because if you are doing it at a team level what you will try to find what are the strengths of our team what are the weaknesses of our team what are the opportunities open to the team and what are the threats to the team same you could do at the highest level, like strategic level. Uh, as an organization, you can look at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But why we are so interested in project for do, doing this SWOT analysis? Because you see, the first two items, strengths and weaknesses, are your uh, are internal to, to to your team, or whatever analysis, wherever you are applying this analysis, they are your strengths and weaknesses. And you just need to identify what are your strengths and weaknesses as, as if you can build on your strengths and you can eradicate your weaknesses. And that is totally in your control to, to do that. But as far as opportunities and threats are concerned, if you remember, opportunities and threats are the positive and negative risks. Right? So opportunity and threat, when I talk about, I am talking about the risk management. So SWOT analysis can result in identification of a lot many risks, right? We could identify uh, many opportunities in the project and many threats in the project, and they will be our, our preliminary list of risks identified at that point in time. Then we have got the affinity diagram. Affinity diagram is a technique that allows large numbers of ideas to be classified into groups for review and analysis. So, uh, do you get it? I uh, I have got a number of uh, ideas coming uh, uh, in a brainstorming session maybe. We have got um, 30 or 40 different ideas, but is it possible that we can classify them in some kind of grouping? As if I know, okay, these are the risks to the schedule, these are the risks to the cost, these are the risks to this and that. So we can categorize those risks in, in some kind of groups and review and analyze them accordingly. So affinity diagram might be very useful for doing that. Uh, then we have assumptions analysis. As far as the assumptions are concerned, you remember that when we were uh, trying to identify the requirements, there, there might be uh, clarity in some of the requirements and some of the requirements might not, not have been really very clear, right? Uh, and because those things are not very clear, so what I did was I might have taken certain assumptions because I can't uh, move ahead and, uh, without a data. I don't have any data. So I assume that, okay, for now, let us calculate things based on as uh, this assumption that this will uh, take this much time or this much money or something like that. So you take certain assumptions. Naturally, that is your best guess. But those assumptions might go wrong. So keep a red flag on wherever you have taken an assumption because assumptions might 
turn into risks in future. But remember, assumptions might also go, go right. So that means those assumptions who prove to be right, they will be adopted as such. And those assumptions which prove to be wrong, they enter into the uh, realm of risks, right? So assumptions, uh, uh, as we move ahead in the life of the project, uh, certain things will further clarify and some assumption may prove right or wrong. And as soon as I know for a fact what is the right numbers, we I can replace my assumption with the right numbers, right? So that means the assumption will no more be an assumption. It would be then a fact, right? And my calculations which I have done in my planning might either be proven right or wrong. If it is right, then we go smoothly. And if we were wrong, we apply that correction and correct it. That is where the risk might have occurred. Then is the document review. Look at the old documents, previous lessons learned, or old projects. Uh, are, you know, maybe uh, it might be documented in books. What kind of risks are there in this type of project? So you review the documents and from that you can, uh, it can be very helpful in identifying risk. Then we have got a Delphi technique. Uh, well, before I can describe it, I would like to ask you if you have heard about this technique, Delphi technique. Yes, please, anyone? I uh, no. No, okay. Kelvin, you don't know about Delphi technique? I think I have used that, but don't remember. Okay. I think it's a kind of conversational technique, something like this. Okay, okay. But yeah. Okay, you, you, I, I have to give you a concept here about uh, about this. Uh, you see, when we are we are in a meeting or in a group discussing something, there are some people who are more knowledgeable uh, or more influential, right? And others who are attending the meeting or who are in the session, they might be suppressed just due to the knowledge or influence of those people. So they don't li like to sound their opinion uh, with, uh, on the risk that they might look stupid. You understand my point? So they don't give their opinion and that is a big negative because everybody is not sounding their opinion in meetings. So this technique, uh, Delphi technique, is to eradicate that influence of uh, more influential people on less influential people uh, and we try to take the opinion of everyone anonymously without telling anyone who gave this, this, this opinion. So those opinions are collected anonymously and then they are all displayed on a, on a whiteboard. And then everybody present in the meeting is asked to, uh, to vote on which is the best idea or which uh, give a priority to these ideas. So that way, we won't miss any opinion. No opinion will be suppressed. But naturally, only those ideas which are of highest priority will get, get the precedence. I hope you understand this. So this is called Delphi technique. Although this is uh, uh, probably a refined form of Delphi I'm talking about. In olden days, when it was invented, it was like, you know, uh, we would uh, collect the opinions through uh, through kind of email or some other means. Uh, they were not even sitting face to face. And those opinions were collected by in writing. And then they were summarized into a list. And that list was to, send, to be sent back to all of those peoples again, uh, as if they can vote on them, right? <clears throat> and then we, we would uh, do this time and again until... Uh, the priority uh, we get out of it is same by everyone. Like we are trying to gain a consensus on that. We ask for opinions time and again about their priorities and then uh, we shortlist certain things and send the list again back to the, the group. And they, we'll do this exercise a number of times 
until we get the same priority from everyone. So that was the basically the basic Delphi technique. But now because we are um, think, doing things online and uh, face to face, though, so we, we should have a modified Delphi technique used where we don't waste time um, sending emails or sending letters to everyone and then waiting for the response. We want instantaneous decision to come out. So this Delphi technique, which I'm talking about, is modify, modified Delphi technique, which is instantaneous. Then we have got a Monte Carlo simulation for larger organizations and larger projects. This is um, kind of a, whatever the data we have collected in cost uh, uh, and schedule, that data is, uh, is put into a statistical engine and we create a kind of a simulation of that. Well, okay, in worst case scenario, how the project will perform. In the best case scenario, how the project will perform. So basically, we get a picture that this project can uh, uh, at minimum do this much and at maximum do the, this much. I mean, the, uh, from the perspective of time and cost, right? So the, for example, this project can uh, earliest be completed in this time and can latest be completed by this time. So we will have a range that this is the range of possibility in which this project can be done. Same can be true for the, uh, for the cost. So that simulation, which I'm not going into detail, is called a Monte Carlo simulation. And this is basically a tool for risk, you know, analysis or what you can uh, say for risk identification. So these are some of the data gathering techniques for when we are trying to identify uh, the risk because we have to be very thorough. We don't want to, you know, just uh, uh, skip some of the important risks. So we, uh, we do a risk breakdown structure, which kind of uh, uh, is, a, is a kind of a categorization. Then we identify risk according to the categories. We do brainstorming as if we, can, uh, we could get uh, those ideas which otherwise could not have come to our mind. And then voting and all, you see, all of these methods are basically for the purposes of risk identification. This is an example of a risk breakdown structure where we have uh, it, it could have been just like uh, the organization structure from top down, but this one shown here is uh, from left to right. It is expanding from left to right. So basically, the leftmost is kind of, uh, uh, if in an organization structure, uh, there's a top level, right? So all sources of risk, that is the uh, for the project. Uh, they, this is one ma major category. Under that category, we could have many subcategories. For example, we could have technical risks, management risks, commercial risks, external risks, or you could choose your own category. And then those categories can further be broken down into another level. For example, technical risk related to scope definition, related to requirement definition, and so on and so forth. So once you have this uh, categorization in front of you, it would be much simpler when you are identifying the risk because you can, uh, uh, in your risk identification meeting, you can ask them, okay, we will take them in a sequence. First of all, you will discuss the technical risk. So anyone who can come up with a scope definition risk, right? We discuss that for uh, for a while and then we move on to the next, next subcategory and then to the next subcategory. So this is a thorough mechanism of identifying uh, risks in all subcategories. It may take long, but this is uh, going to encompass all. But there is a disadvantage of this method. And that is, if something was not identified as a subcategory, we will skip to identify risks in that. Right? So maybe when we develop this uh, uh, risk breakdown structure, uh, we did not do it very well and we missed out our subcategory. So then naturally it is being used as a template. When we use it for identification of risk, we will not be uh, talking about that missing subcategory, right? Although it is very much possible that you can add new subcategories uh, in future, that is fine, but that uh, would be better if we could identify all these subcategories uh, very carefully in the beginning. 
So this is how it looks like. Then uh, the next step that now the risk identification has been done. We have a list of all the risks available with us. Now we have to process them. We have to qualify them and then quantify them. Actually, this is called the risk assessment or risk analysis. Now this could be done in two ways. One is the qualitative assessment and the other is a quantitative assessment. And as you might understand, qualitative assess assessment is subjective in nature and quantitative assessment is objective in nature. I hope you are understanding me. What do I mean, mean by subjective and objective? For example, I am looking at a crowd and I want to analyze, uh, you know, generally how many people are there in this crowd. Then qualitatively, I would just say, okay, it looks like a big crowd and because it is filling uh, this much space, uh, so probably there are more than, uh, you know, uh, 100,000 people there in the crowd, right? Probably, you know, it is not, you did not count them specifically. So this is a subjective or qualitative assessment. But when you physically count them and uh, then you can even try to segregate them into their different age groups and things like that, that would be an objective assessment or quant quantitative assessment. Now, what I'm trying to get to is um, we don't get every risk through the quantitative assessment. Why? Every risk passes through a qualitative assessment, but not through the quantitative statement, assessment. Only those risks which we need to understand better, then we, we may use the quantitative assessment. But generally, qualitative assessment might be sufficient. Why am I saying that? What do you think? Yes, please. Anyone? Okay, let me let me tell you that um, if the information that this crowd uh, is approximately 100,000 is good enough for me to make my further decisions and uh, rather than going into the micro details of how many are male and how many are female, what is their different age groups, I don't need to know that. If I have to do the uh, crowd management, I would rather just look at this qualitative data and I can take my decisions. So generally, uh, because there are so many risks in the project, there could be thousands of risks in your project. If you start quantitatively analyzing each and every risk, that might take more, uh, more time and money than what you have reserved for the whole project, right? That, is, that could be a very uphill task. So to be intelligent, you will say, say that, okay, I have to go into only this much detail and that would be sufficient for me to kind of establish a priority of the risk, see which risk is bigger than the other one. Like we use in Agile, we don't do exact calculation, but we do approximation. We are more subjective there. Here also, uh, we uh, in risk management, we are basing our decisions on how to deal with these risks on subjective or qualitative assessment. Now, once we are doing the qualitative uh, assessment, we will assess each risk and put them into a right category. That is called qualitative assessment. And then why and how the quantitative assessment can be used. Um, you know, if the qualitative assessment is enough to guide me into developing a risk response, if I say, okay, there are 100,000 people in the crowd, and my response could be maybe 100 policemen can, can deal with them, right? So that would be very fine. I, I have, uh, I created my strategy. Um, I, I actually developed my response without even counting the people. So I have done based on the qualitative assessment. If I can develop a response, I will do that. And in most of the cases, that can be done. That can be done. Uh, why then, uh, what is the purpose of quantitative risk analysis uh, that is going objective on that? That is for a very uh, novel kind of a purpose. 
and that is uh, i want to see what is the overall impact of all the risks on the project right so somehow i have to come to some figure that this is the total risk on the project uh, all positives and negatives included uh, would be having this much burden on the project so that is through a quantitative analysis or i want to determine uh, uh, at at any one point in the life of the project how risky that point is for example it is a one year long project and i am talking about um, the last day of third month so i would be able to understand what are the risks current in that time and how much is uh, you know is the amount i require for all of the, uh, the those risks to to deal with so at any point uh, one point in time of the project how risky that point is because you understand that there might be more than one risk might which could be occurring at the same time right so this uh, qualitative analysis uh, quantitative analysis could tell me that which point in the life of the project is the most riskiest and which is the most safest and overall how risky my project is now this is not only required for the <clears throat> purposes of managing the project but this is also required for making high level decisions at the strategic level or at the portfolio level that this project is getting to be in, into a chaotic zone zone and probably we should close the project or something like that so such like this in will be based on these quantitative assessments <clears throat> hope uh, i was able to somehow give you an idea what these qualitative and quantitative assessments could look like are you comfortable with the idea okay now let us talk about the probability and impact uh, i hope you understand and uh, you know uh, you have a clear picture that a project what is most sensitive what are the project objectives in a project naturally scope time and cost and to some extent quality right so basically if anything could affect the scope or time or cost or even the quality of the project that could be a risk right if there is a uncertainty in scope in time in cost or in quality that could be uh, could be a risk so therefore i have to look at that how much Uh, does a risk if, uh, if impacts the time cost quality and uh, its scope is not shown shown here but i would say scope uh, uh, could be shown separately or it could be considered part of the quality scope oblique quality you can say that right because both of them are descriptive whereas time and cost can be numeric in nature right so just consider that quality where there is written quality it is not only the quality it is also the scope inclusive okay uh, that is one thing we have to consider if if a risk can, uh, okay a basic definition of the risk is uh, a risk is a risk only when it does have an impact on the project objective do you understand me if you say that this is a risk you have identified something as a risk but you can't prove to me that it has any impact on the on the schedule on the cost or on the scope of the project i would not consider that as a risk at all do you understand my point so anything which is not having any impact on scope time or cost uh, or for that matter quality will not be treated as a risk okay so naturally that means these these are the impacts i am having scope time cost and maybe quality okay a risk is made up of two things a risk any risk is made up of two things one how much is the possibility of this risk happening that is called probability and how how much will be the impact or effect of this risk on the project now this effect or impact on the project is in shape of project objectives 
impact on the scope, impact on the time, impact on cost or quality, right? So uh, you can say that the first column shows the probability and the remaining columns collectively represents the impact, right? But now it, it could differ from case to case because in one project, uh, out of the scope, time and cost, the most sensitive area is time. So naturally, you will give more weightage to time. If money is the concern, you might be giving more weightage to the cost. So anyways, when you're trying to, you know, calculate the overall impact of our risk, we have to collectively look at uh, the scope, time and cost and quality uh, uh, in whatever proportion whichever is suited to that environment and that would uh, tell us that this is the impact uh, this is an impact of say uh, two hundred thousand dollars on the project or this has uh, a time impact of a delay of uh, 10 days on the project or things like that <clears throat> so we classify all of these things into certain number of categories and it is good to have uh, at least five categories that is uh, uh, scales are established like very high, high, medium, low, and very low. And then we describe, okay, what will be, how, what probability is considered very high? Anything more than 70% could, you could assign it as a very high. Anything between 51 and 70 could be considered high. 31 to 50, medium. 11 to 30, low. And 1 to 10 could be considered as a very low. Right? So all the risks are passing through this, uh, this uh, you know, um, probability and impact thing. And we are trying to assess, or in a way, we are trying to prioritize the higher risks upwards. So this scale which I am showing you, this is not a scale by default. You could assign your own scale by the nature of your project. You could say, in my case, very high would be anything more than 60%. That is fine. You uh, and your team and your stakeholders together would actually design these scales. Okay, for a specific project, which we are talking, let us see what are the scales for time. A delay of more than six months is very high. A delay of three to six months is high. One to three months is a medium. And one to four weeks is a low and one week delay is very low. That is what this table shows. But this might not be very appropriate in your project. So you decide how much is too much and how much is too less. Maybe the project which we are talking here is uh, maybe a construction project of say three years long. And in that one week of delay could be considered very low. And... Uh, one to four weeks could, could still be considered very, uh, uh, could should be, uh, uh, may be considered as low. And up to six months delay is very high, right? More than six months delay could be considered very high. But in if you are doing an IT project, which uh, is only there for three months, then probably we can't apply this, uh, the, this, the, this scale to them. So we have to amend these scales. Maybe we say, okay, very low could be a delay of one day right? Low could be a delay of three days. Medium could be a delay of uh, seven days. High could be a delay of uh, seven to ten days. And very high could be more than ten days. So, you see, we can develop our own scale. So, the chart or diagram I am showing you, this is not cast in stone. This is not exactly showing what you will do in your project. You have to develop your probability and impact definition you have to create this chart for yourself. Similarly, for cost, uh, how much over expenditure is all right with you? It says, uh, well, uh, more than 5 million is very high. Uh, 1 to 5 million is high. Uh, 500,000 to 1 million is medium. 100,000 to 500,000 is low. And anything less than 100,000 is uh, having um, is not uh, uh, is very low right now why we are showing the upper things are very high and high in darker colors red and 
purple and things like that. Um, and the, uh, we have got lighter colors below because those risks which are categorized at very low, low or medium may be, uh, may be acceptable to us. We may decide that they, they are within our appetite and we don't want to consider them. Or maybe we, we say, okay, we pend our plan on them and we focus on the very high and high item and we process them. Similarly, you can develop a, a scale for quality and scope. Like it says, very low could be minor impact on secondary functionality and low could be minor impact on overall functionality. Medium could be some impact on key functionality and high would be significant impact on overall functionality and very high is very significant impact on overall functionality. So naturally it is uh, covering the quality as well as the scope. So you must have uh, something like this created as if you can do the further analysis because these are uh, these scales you have established, they are going to be used in the next diagram, which is called probability and impact matrix. So draw a, a, a chart like this in which you have probability go, coming from top down and impact traveling from left to right. So more impact is on this side and more probability is downwards, right? And these are the five figures we had chosen. Uh, one could be very low, low, high, uh, medium, high, very high. And similarly, probability very low, uh, low, medium, high, very high. You understand that? Now, let us consider there is a risk which was classified as uh, 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 on the impact scale that has been uh, categorized as three are, are the medium and on the what do you call it uh, uh, the other scale on the impact scale uh, uh, sorry sorry on the uh, sorry on the likelihood scale it was uh, graded as medium and on the impact scale which is a combination of scope time and everything so scope time cost the overall impact that could uh, that might have come out to be uh, uh, high so three here and four here, and if you join them, uh, simply multiply three by four, three and four, it is 12. This is where you stand. That risk is located in this, in this box where it is written 12. Now you have placed that risk here, uh, 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 make a pointer here, put this risk, uh, risk at that place. Like I can say, okay, this is this is the risk. Okay, what else? There is another risk which is placed like like here, another risk here, another risk here, another risk here, then another risk here, and we can keep putting more risk, more risks wherever they are applicable. So we can have thousands of risks in our project. So these are all the risks we have. Then we decide that okay. Uh, maybe, you know, if you are very sensitive about the risk, uh, we, we could say, okay, uh, anything which is medium and high would be considered a risk and other things, I mean, they could be considered as high priority items in risk and others could be put into, uh, into, uh, into a box and we can deal with them later. For That means uh, anything more than seven or greater than seven is a big risk. You understand? So red, purple area, red area, and the golden area. These are the areas. Only these risks are uh, are considered uh, immediate and high, right? And those risks in the yellow area, they are considered secondary and low priority. And in the green area, they are very low. They can even be accepted. Do you agree with me? So what I have done is just by doing this qualitative analysis, I was able to prioritize all my risks on this table. I will just note down all the risks in the uh, golden, red and uh, purple area. I will just take them and I will start uh, developing my responses for them. As far as the other, the yellow and green area risks are concerned, I will say they are too small and I'll put them in a box and I will assign a contingency 
amount for them. I am not going to waste a lot my, of my time in, uh, in, pro, in developing responses for each and every one of them. Interestingly, you will observe that 80-20 rule, the Pareto law, applies here as well. Right? The uh, Those risks which are, uh, well, I didn't draw, draw it like that. Uh, basically, uh, I would have more points in this area. There could be a lot many risks there, much more than what we have in the red and other areas. So the basic rule is that if we can address the 20% of high priority risk, that, uh, I mean 20% categories of the high priority risk, that will take, take care of 80% of risk. Right? The high priority are very high priority and the medium priority uh, all the risk collectively, they, they are big, big. Okay, let me give you another example. For example, uh, there is a heap of stones in front of you, which contains varying sizes of stones, even particles and very big stones, right? This is a heap of sto whole stones and you are asked to sort out, you are asked to sort out those stones which are bigger than the size of six, six, six inches. How can you do that? I'm trying to do a, a analysis in which I'm picking out the medium, high and very high levels. So my minimum size, acceptable size is six, six inches diameter and above. How will you do that? There is a big heap of stones in front of you, right? It has got varying sizes of stones. I have asked you to sort them out in a way that the stones which are bigger than the six inches dia are segregated. How can you do that? And you have to do it kind of instantaneously. How can you do that? Not quantitatively, do it qualitatively. If you say that I will look at each and every stone, measure it and then do it, that is quantitative method of doing it. That will take ages. But I am giving you just say half an hour to sort them out. How can you do that? Categorize them. How? Like, you know, um... It's more like you know. Um, for I can give you give you the answer based on your example, like you know, for the stones, mm -hmm, you can stone. categorize them, and based on shape, color, or like you know, um, Sh shape, color doesn't matter. We just need uh, anything which is more than six inches dia. That is a, okay. uh, that is to be picked out. Yeah. Um. Like. Uh, estimation like um, the weight or size estimation mm -hmm. okay uh, hold that thought uh, Kelvin what do you think being an engineer you must be doing that all the time you may, may be seeing people oh, no. <laughs> no. No? okay where is Alexandra probably yeah yes Alexandra what do you say I'm sorry, I had to take a call. Okay. I, was, I had to step away. Okay, no problem, no problem. Okay, um, let me put you wise on that. Um, especially in the construction projects, you might have seen the heaps of stones are lying there. And there are some people who are segregating big stones from the small stones by a very simple technique. By the technique, we call it screening or filtering. They have got a uh, uh, iron mesh with a, with the specific size which they want to be to be sorted out, and they then through some machine or physically they are uh, kind of throwing all the heap of stones on that mesh, and anything which is larger than six inches is held up. Everything smaller goes down. Does it make sense? 
So this is, I didn't measure any of the stones. I didn't have uh, handle any, any one of the stones, but I was able to sort them out in high priority and low priority items. Didn't, we? didn't I? So basically when I said that I draw a line here, that these golden red and dark red, maybe anything greater than that is probably matters to me. So this is all more than six inches kind of that thing. And anything lower than that is not considered to be dealt with immediately. So that, those are the, these are the small stones. But just try to imagine uh, if I uh, I take the total weight of a whole a whole of the heap initial heap heap of stones they may be hundred tons right after the sorting I find that it uh, the stones which have been picked out the big stones they are only twenty percent in number. But out of the collective weight, they are 80% of the weight. 80 kg of stones are, uh, if you count them out of the total stones, number of stones, they could be only 20% of stones. But they are carrying 80% of weight. So here I apply 80-20 rule that if I can take out the biggest stones, that will take care of 80% of load. Right? Rest, everything, I should not waste my time. I should put those 20% stones away in a box. And uh, according to the weight of that total box, that is 20 tons uh, is the total weight of that, I will allocate the contingency for them. I will not develop any response for them. I will allocate contingency. And if any one of those occur, we will pay for it. That is okay. We have decided to accept them. Agreed? So, this is the method. Okay. Now, what you can do is you can note all this information in your risk register where you supply the name and the number for every risk and a description or name for every risk and what is the impact of that risk and what are the impact level scores? Maybe here in impact description, you can write uh, uh, in, uh, in description, what will happen if the risk is not mitigated or eliminated? Maybe a descriptive statement could be written here. And you can rate it from one to five. So it we gave it a rating of impact as five. That is the overall impact of time, scope, and cost and quality, right? So that is five here. And uh, the, the probability is, uh, um, is one here, which is low, and 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 risk score is uh, uh, the the impact multiplied by probability. So five multiplied by one is five. In the second case, five into two ten. In the third case, three into three nine. So that will give me a, a probability and impact score. And ultimately, what is going to be the trigger condition? How would we know that we have to now take action on that risk? And remember. We won't take any action after the risk has occurred, but we will keep monitoring the risk. And when it is close enough, then we will take action. This we have to decide what is considered close enough. Is it, you know, uh, like, you know, there is a bomb to blast. If, if uh, um, is it uh, one second before the blast, should I take the action? Or is it uh, at least five hours below, before the blast, I should take the action? So this trigger will tell me that how far um, uh, the actual blast is going to be away. And I would have this much reaction time and this should be enough in which I should uh, take measures to neutralize that bomb. So whatever your uh, trigger condition that could be written here, your action plan could be written here and uh, every risk has a risk owner. Somebody should be held responsible for every risk. So whomsoever is held responsible, that is called the risk owner, the name of that person could be written here. Another way of putting this risk list could be a simpler chart where we have got risks, probability, impact, and their overall magnitude, that is 
5 into 6 is 30. Here the scale is from 1 to 10, right? You can, uh, if, if you have to go uh, set the scale from 1 to 10, that this could be some something like this is the picture, right? So uh, when you have these magnitude figures or the probability multiplied by impact figures, you can simply sort it out in in um, in the in a priority like highest item on top and lowest item on on below and then you can pick out the top items and that would um, help you take care of eighty percent of risks. So, El, yes, please. In the risk register that you you had there, uh, the risk register that I've used in the past, we also include one column to control all the mitigations that we can implement to you know reduce or or diminish the impact on the of this risk to to the project so this column that you have here planned response mm -hmm. is equivalent to that one you put in there yeah. all the actions oh sorry mitigation uh yeah exactly risk response is actually talking about all five six different methods like mitigation, like you know, acceptance. Any and any whatever. controls that you can implement yeah, to exactly. Okay. okay, thank you. Most welcome. Okay, then uh, there is uh, yet another tool which is a very interesting tool, and uh, uh, that is uh, we have got these tools which are for simulation purposes. Monte Carlo, I have already described to you what it looks like. Uh, Monte Carlo is like you no know, uh, a probability distribution kind of a thing, right? I'm not showing it here, but here what you see is is a sensitivity analysis and specifically the diagram in front of you is called a tornado diagram. This is a sensitivity analysis and as a result of a sensitivity analysis, we get a tornado diagram. Now these tools are very simple. They are very easy. Although they look very technical, but they are very easy. What I have done is I, uh, I said, okay, risk could be negative, risk could be positive. So in the, I drew a middle line like this one and on the right hand side are the risks might be which are uh, uh, which are positive and on the left hand side risks which are negative right so incidentally in this example we have more positive risks i mean uh, more opportunities than than the risk than the threats but anyways <clears throat> the biggest of, of, of them all the largest volume of risk whether it is negative or positive we will plot here because it is a positive one, because it is an opportunity, and that is the largest one, we'll put it up like a bar here. Then the second, um, incidentally, that is also an opportunity that also goes as a bar, but it is going to be smaller than the top bar. Then we have a threat, which is negative, and therefore it will go on the other side, but that will have the bar, bar would be like this, and this is how it is going to be drawn. So what do you see here? This diagram, does it look like a tornado to you? Right? So just a little bit of imagination is required. Like, you know, to, uh, let me... Okay. Like, you know, the, this is the, like a tornado going and the things like that. Right? So this, is, this looks like a tornado. So we started calling it tornado diagram. Okay. What next? Quantitative risk analysis methods were more we have, uh, recent tree analysis. Uh, this is interesting because uh, here we have uh, various options. If I take this decision, either this will occur or that will occur. And if I go with this option, then we have got another set of options. So I will have to very safely and soundly travel on the safest path and the most beneficial path. That is how I take my decisions to reach uh, um, through the safest area to the destination. I should be I should maximize my profits like that. Maybe I can show a diagram if it is there. Uh, then we have got influence diagram. Uh, that is quality management graphical aid shows elements of uncertainty caused by this using ranges or probability distribution, meaning what can impact what. 
expected monetary value is kind of uh, uh, relevant to the decision entry well in decision entry you are just interested in the best safest path whereas in expected monetary value we actually calculate how much benefit or loss are we getting on that path and at the end of the path there is a amount calculated that this path has got this expected monetary value so if there are uh, eight different paths then i will look at the expected monetary value of each path and whichever is best for us we will choose it right so this is a very close relative to the decision tree analysis but it is uh, uh, more monetary in nature this is not generic uh, uh, you know decision tree but it is uh, we are rather depending on the ultimate result coming out of that path then uh, risks time cost and life cycle predictive projects are most often affected by the impact of cost related risks whereas adaptive projects are affected by the impact of the time related risk why uh, why is it so do you agree with that yes do you you agree with this statement and what is your reason uh because any risk sorry carry on yeah um any risk can affect um projects mm -hmm. and it's not like you know nothing to do either it's um adaptive or agile um mm -hmm. you know any risk i think any risk can affect um the productivity or like you know um the result of the project mm -hmm. Like, you know, by delaying, sometimes delaying, sometimes like, you know, extra cost and um, sometimes uh, not being um, um, like, you know, in terms of quality. Okay. Um, but what is so specific about predictive and adaptive projects? Predictive is, is where the scope is fixed and time and cost is flexible. But in an agile project, an adaptive project, we have got time and cost fixed and scope is variable. So keep that, mind, uh, that in mind to answer this question. Predictive projects are most often affected by impact of cost-related risk. Uh, well, if they, uh, because the scope is fixed, cost and time both can you know, damage the pr predictive project. But if we are cost conscious in that cost is more important to you, probably this could be right. And uh, even time could be right there. But in adaptive project, it says they are affected by the impact of time related risks only, not the cost related risk. Well, uh, uh, because it is uh, the, the, the uh, requirements are changing, the user stories are being added and all. So naturally, there will be the scope is changing and there might be more time required to spend on that. But my argument is that we have found that in agile project, we might even be able to complete the work earlier than, than our predictive project. Because when we deliver the high value early, the, the client, the customer may decide to close on the project on that value. But anyways, uh, th these are my arguments about it, but this statement doesn't seem very true for me. Uh, another question, do you think each of these typical risks is more typical of predictive or adaptive projects? Can you explain why? First, it talks delivery date slip. Where does it happen more? We have slipped the delivery date. It is a predictive or an uh, uh, agile project. For me to speak okay. about adaptive, mm -hmm. and I can tell on the on mm -hmm. the predictive, yep. yeah, it's a big problem. You know, not meeting these kind of milestones. Mm -hmm. And uh, what were you saying, Fatma? Um, agile because um, few minutes back you said that like um for adaptive it's a. Uh, uh, mostly um, affecting the cost because it's a fixed. No, 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 no. I did not agree with that statement. Oh, okay. I did not agree with that statement because you see, 
Uh, delivery rate slippage is more of the concern of a predictive project. In Agile, we don't worry about date slippage because if something is not complete, we'll put it back into the product backlog. It will be done in the subsequent uh, iteration. So we are not really concerned about the delivery date slippage, right? And stretched resources, uh, we don't have this problem in Agile because we have fixed team members and they are going to be with us throughout. So it's not a very long team. Again, predictive. Lack of clarity. What 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 are we talking about? Um, Adaptive. Adaptive. Because you see, we don't know the whole, all of the requirements as yet, and we have still started doing it. So things that may not be clear, but as and when we go forward, we may get this clarity. So this is the case for adaptive. Scope creep. Scope creep. Scope creep. Let me define it for you. Scope creep are those changes in a project which are unofficial, which come without any due process, without any, uh, you know, approval, right? So scope creep is not a problem in Agile because if the requirements are changing, they are officially changing and we are doing them in our iteration. Scope creep is a, a traditional predictive problem. Got it? Yes. Okay. Coming over to risk responses, what you were, were referring to, Kelvin. So risk responses should be appropriate for the significance of the risk. They should be cost effective, not, you know, should not be spending more than what the risk is worth. worth. So we must, the cost of the response should be much lesser than the impact of the risk. Realistic within the project context, agreed to by the relevant stakeholders and owned by a responsible person. There must be a risk owner who should be held responsible. So when we are talking about risk responses, there are a few more terms we need to understand. One is, uh, naturally we know what a risk is, but and we, we also know what a trigger is. Uh, we also understand that all the risks have to be responded, so the, what the risk response is. Now, what is a secondary risk? Secondary risk is a risk resulting from a identified risk. We don't know. Uh, we could not have identified it when we identified the primary risk. But once the primary risk did occur, then we realize that there is another risk which arises out of the primary risk. Although we dealt with the primary risk, but then there is another risk lurking over our heads. That is a secondary risk. Because this is germinated out of the primary risk, therefore it is generally assumed that it is not going to be ever bigger than the primary risk. It is a smaller risk than the primary risk. But uh, in some school of thoughts, we consider that maybe the thing which is hiding behind this uh, mountain, the the uh, the mountain behind this mountain might look might may not be visible right now but when you uh, get to the top of this mountain you will find that the other mountain is much higher than this one so keep that possibility in mind that secondary risk can be even even larger than the primary risk but generally speaking that will not but that is not visible that we don't know when we identified the primary risk we didn't know what can happen to us. There could be a secondary risk and what could that be? Residual risk. When you process a risk, a primary risk, when you address it, when you take some responses, take some actions to reduce that risk, uh, maybe that was a $100,000 risk and we, uh, we took certain actions by, and that reduced it to $10,000. That is instrumental decrease, but at the same time, it is still a risk of $10,000. That is called the residual risk. Then we have got uh, two more terms. One is the contingency reserve or allowance and contingency fallback plan. Let me clarify that contingency reserve is a term related to risk management, right? All the actions, all the responses you create, they are funded out of this contingency reserve are allowed. But when a risk has occurred and it has become an issue, that 
those, those you know those issues have to be resolved and we need money for that as well so contingency plan uh, caters for that that is an alternate plan if something bad happens what could be the alternate route we can take towards our original destination so to change that path uh, we have an alternate plan we have a contingency plan we have a fallback plan and naturally that is more relevant to issues contingency plan is more relevant to issues issue resolution and contingency reserve is more relevant to the risk response planning got it okay these are the various strategies naturally we have positive risk we have negative risk we have five strategies to treat the threats and five pro uh, strategies to deal with the opportunities although they are kind of uh, are related to each other but they are opposite to each other okay now, uh, the first strategy is if i have identified a risk whether it was positive or negative in my project and uh, that risk we did identify in the project but taking any action on that risk is too big for us and we may have to escalate it to the next higher authority we can't take any action on that risk that risk is beyond our call of duty so our first strategy in both cases would be to escalate the risk upwards simple second uh if it is a negative risk my first instinct would be to somehow avoid this risk right i may consider that okay how can i shirk away from this maybe there is a lot of traffic on a road and i have to travel on that road but i learn that there is going to be clogged so what i do i change my path i move on an other route which may take a little more time a little more money but i have avoided that big risk of being held for say 5 to 6 hours in the traffic that is called avoidance on the other hand if it was an opportunity uh, i would not have avoided it what strategy could i have if it was a good luck thing it was an opportunity in my way maybe there is something some advantage some benefit if i go through a diff, uh, alternate route to my destination they may be distributing some um, you know prices there although that is not in my route but i change my route to exploit that opportunity so that is the reverse of avoidance for a negative risk we avoid it for a positive risk we try to exploit it naturally while we exploit we again have to change our route we may have to incur some cost and you know um, uh, some time but at the same time we are going to be benefited out of it whereas uh, when we avoid a threat we are uh, you know uh, shirking away from the damage that risk could cause us third strategy is uh, uh, for the negative risk it is transfer transfer means i don't uh, i i i don't want to uh, handle this risk so let it be handled by an expert right so what i do is i hire someone to deal with the problem and i will pay for that naturally that payment i am making to that uh, that party is not going to be as high as the risk itself so at an at a nominal cost i will transfer the risk on to the other party this could be done in case of a insurance in case of a contract <clears throat> a risk uh, a risky contract in which all the risk is transferred to the to the <clears throat> contractor like the fixed price contract fixed price contract all the risk is shifted transferred to the contract now the reverse of transfer in case of an opportunity is share if i have got an opportunity and that is too big for me alone to enjoy then maybe i can share it with other parties that is called sharing that is a reverse of transfer then comes the mitigation mitigation means in case of threat we are trying to reduce 
either the probability or the impact of that risk. If we can take certain measures which could de do either one of these two things or both of these two things could uh, considerably reduce the amount of risk. On the other hand, if it was an opportunity, I would rather like to enhance. So I will take measures. I am ready to spend money to increase the probability of the opportunity or to increase the impact of the opportunity or either one of them or both, one, both of them. So that would be called as an enhance. And if we can't do nothing about anything, we have to take, take it up at the, at the face value, whatever comes our way. Although we are, this is called calculated risk taking. I have done my best. I know it can't be escalated, can't be avoided, can't be transferred, can't be mitigated. Then I have to accept it because I, I, there is no action I can take. And ultimately the last action is just to accept it on its face value. But it is not blindly accepting anything. I have gone through a thorough process. I considered all my options. And after doing all the calculations, I found out, well, it is not in my hand. I can't do it. I have to accept it. Similarly, in the opportunity, if you can't escalate, you can't exploit, you can't share, you can't enhance, then whatever coming way, is coming your way, you just accept it. I hope this is uh, this explanation is quite uh, understandable. Okay. Question, which of the following is a good example of mitigating the probability of the risk of becoming overwhelmed with a fire in a newly constructed building? So what, what is the purpose? Mitigating, mitigating the probability. So you have to reduce the probability, right? So what will reduce the probability of the risk of becoming overwhelmed with the fire? Install a smoke detector, install a fireproof component, hire another company to do the part of the work that could result in a fire, keep the phone number of the fire department handy. What do you think? We install the fireproof components. That will save us from the damage, but not the probability. Detectors. Detectors, smoke detectors will uh, will save us from a probability. If it is going to do the hundred percent damage, this detect due to this detector, we could control the fire at twenty percent damage, maybe. Hiring another company is transferring transferring our risk to them. Keeping the phone number of the fire department that is uh, uh, stupid. That is, <laughs> that is nothing. Right. What is the difference between avoiding a threat and mitigating it? Right. So just read out these four options and see which is the best option. Tell me what do you think is the best option? Yeah. C. A. Avoid means C. C. Okay. C says avoid me change the management plan to remove the risk. That is avoiding. How can okay? Uh, remove uh, change the management plan to remove the risk. Okay. And mitigate means to reduce the impact and probability. Second statement is okay, but I am a little apprehensive about the first statement. Avoid means change the management plan to remove the risk, and mitigate means accept no. C is the correct answer. A and B are absolutely not, and C is the only correct answer. Okay, we are done with this. We can have a 10 minute break and then we can move on. Actually, I thought we are, we are. We will be able to do all this in just uh, uh, this much time, but we are still left with one topic and uh, about 20 more slides. So 
we'll talk about quality after 10 minutes, right? Okay, see you again after 10 minutes. Thank you.
Okay, I'm back. Right. Uh, so last topic of lesson three is quality. Uh, it's a short lesson, but we will take uh, take the basics out of it. And uh, this is very simple. Um, naturally, all of us, when we do, we are doing project, quality is naturally a big concern for us. So we develop a quality management plan. And the basic purpose is that product we are producing out of uh, this project must adhere to the quality standards. And actually, that is what we call the quality control, right? So we verify each and every part of the product as soon as it is produced and it is to be delivered to the customer. We have to do the quality control through inspections. And kind of uh, it's a kind of a verification that product is going fine. And ultimately, it can be handed over to the customer. There is another thing about quality. There is a quality of the process while the, the we are undergoing the project and we are producing the product we are actually doing a lot of work a lot of processes are involved and those processes actually count towards the ultimate quality of the product so basically if we can look at the quality of the work uh, if the quality of the work or the processes is fine then we could reduce a lot of load in quality control. We don't have to do a lot of inspections and to put a lot of load on quality control if we can have a good quality assurance. Uh, so uh, that is called quality assurance and that could be done by regularly, uh, you know, uh, auditing the work we are doing and uh, uh, checking whether they are doing it in the right manner Remember, quality assurance does not mean that we are checking the product in that process. We are not at all concerned about the product. We are concerned about the process. How well are the people working? Are they following the processes or not? Right. As far as product quality is concerned, that could also be checked simultaneously, but that would be considered part of quality control. Right. The degree to which a set of inherent characteristics fulfill requirements that include stakeholder expectations and user satisfaction, naturally requirement came from there. And there could be some other things that you may be uh, bound by certain compliances with some um, standards or regulations like the quality policy of the organization, ISO standards you are following. So all your project work will be complying according to those policies and standards. And the other thing about quality is that we have the element of continuous improvement. When we, 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 do, we catch a flaw in the process or the product, we improve it, we correct it. And this keeps happening all the time. So this is a part, continuous improvement is part of quality assurance. If there is a mistake caught in the product, quality assurance people are informed that these kind of flaws are coming in the product and they can check their processes if that could fix it. Right? So you understand that quality assurance is a different work. Quality control is a different work, but they contribute to each other. Quality assurance, bad quality assurance will result in more errors in quality control. And if there is a, you know, we are continuously improving as a result of the quality control readings, then we could be doing the quality assurance in a more effective manner. Then we have a concept of cost of quality. Now, you see, uh, what is the cost of quality? Cost of quality is basically about uh, uh, spending money on quality. How much money should we spend on quality? But then there are two categories to it. One is cost of good quality. And second is cost of poor quality. If we don't have any assurance or any mechanism of checking, and we just do keep doing our work, 
And at the end of the day, when the quality control people check and reject a lot of material, that is uh, uh, what is causing the internal and external failures. Look at the right hand side. You see internal failures could in include faulty product may need rework, more money required, or it could be as bad that it could be scrapped. So total damage, total loss. That is internal failure because the product has not been uh, cleared for the customer. Customer has not seen it. So customer is not unhappy, but at least uh, we are unhappy because we have wasted a lot of money. There is some problem. Second is external failure cost. That is when the faulty product reaches the hands of the customer. So th that could result in a lot of uh, financial damage to us. It could be liabilities imposed by the customer on us. It could be warranties invoked. Or maybe customer is so angry, they pull their business out, out from us. So we lose the business. So these are the negative impacts of the cost. So, But we have to pay that. We want it or we don't want it. If we don't take any measures, any proactive measures in, you know, uh, towards the good quality, then we will have to pay for the poor quality, right? So we want to reduce our cost of poor quality and maybe increase your cost of good quality, but there should be a balance strike stricken between the, between the two. We should not be spending enormous amounts on either one of them, but there should be a balance in them and we should not be exceeding our quality budget. Anyways, what is the cost of good quality? Naturally, it's a preventive kind of a thing where we uh, train our people, we uh, document our process and ensure they are being followed. We have installed the right equipment for the purpose, time to do work, right resources, infrastructure, expenses, etc. And the other thing is for the control of quality, for the assessment of quality, we may be inviting the teams from ex external external teams and we have to pay for them. So that could be like, you know, uh, testing, inspection, which is basically quality control, but we are paying, paying for that beforehand. Uh, that is a precautionary measure. This is also included in the cost of quality. So prevention cost and appraisal cost is the cost of good quality and internal and external failure costs they are the cost of poor quality. Interestingly, you will note, if you increase your cost of good quality, your cost of poor quality will automatically reduce enormously. That is exactly what we want to achieve here. Okay, that is good enough. Do you understand the concept of cost of quality? Okay, good enough. Uh, okay, stakeholder and customer expectations of quality. So what the stakeholders and customer are having expectations about the quality in a predictive project, uh, the product and deliverable identify the quality requirements during the requirement elicitation and create a quality management. So we must have a quality management plan. And as far as the processes are concerned, ongoing observation and checking of processes should be done as per stated in the quality management plan. And that must be overseen by the quality policy of the organization for the compliance purposes. Your organization should have should have a quality policy and if they don't, then you will have to uh, adopt some quality policy for your project. First, we develop the quality management plan in which we define how are we going to uh, do the quality assurance, quality control, and all those things, all the activities and resources that achieve the quality objective. Is they could be formal, they could be informal, reviewed throughout the project. And the benefits are sharper focus on the project's value proposition, cost reductions, mitigated schedule overruns from rework. So anyways, this is generally the quality management plan. And the compliance requirement, like, you know, your organization has a quality policy, you have to comply with it, you have some other standards to follow or comply. So these are external and internal standards like government regulations, organizational policies, product, project quality requirements, and other project-related risks. 
Then compliance actions also could be like classify compliance categories, determine the potential threats to the compliance. Now this is, we are specifically talking about the compliance uh, regarding, uh, I mean, related risks, compliance related risks, right? So if there, uh, there is a, uh, likelihood that this compliance may not be met, then we have to take certain actions that these risks are very important. They are separately being considered um, and we have a separate risk register for compliance. Okay, quality standards and regulations, naturally we do understand what are the standards, what are the regulations, like standards could be documents established as a model of by an authority custom or by a general consent. Regulation is kind of a rule, right? Requirements that can establish product, process, services, etc., including applicable administration provision with government mandated compliance. De facto standards are uh, widely accepted and adopted through use. You know, people are have been using these de facto standards for ages, so therefore we are also using it. So they are they are widely accepted and adopted. We call just like universal truth and de jure standards or regulations are mandated by law or approved by a recognized body of experts that could be uh, you know initially de facto standards could be a slang and, uh, slangs and jargons in normal language and de jure standards could be new words adding into dictionary over years and uh, they become defined they, they become formal kosher words there Okay, that is so. Uh, okay, let's move on. Quality metrics, checklists and processes. Metrics are naturally the measures by which you, you measure your quality, right? So how, how are you going to test and do things like that? Include a tolerance level that factors in what the customer will accept and describe. Now, what is this tolerance? We have talked about the risk tolerance, but what is the tolerance we are talking here? That is the limit beyond which a specification can be met on the negative side or of the positive side. Like I gave you the example, if uh, there is a one specification that this uh, product should be two feet long, then how much more than two feet is acceptable to the customer and how much less than two feet is acceptable to the customer? It might be in micro millimeters or something like that. We do. But that is what the uh, what is described as the quality. To what level of accuracy, what you know, uh, uh, tolerance level is there with the customer? So read and understand what the customer. When the customer say two feet, just don't accept that specification. Ask them to what level of accuracy do you want it? Do you want it to the accuracy of one millimeter plus and minus, or what? So that is actually what is called the, uh, uh, you know, tolerance limit within the agile. So we have checklists, we have templates, we have quality artifacts in the quality management plan. And in adaptive teams, we use retrospectives after every iteration, you know, you remember. And there we, you know, um, we, we are actually working in small batches to ensure quality. So that is very comfortable quality management in agile is uh, uh, is natural because we are not taking up a lot of load we are just taking up load of one iteration and we can ensure the quality of whatever we are producing there uh, there are various methods in quality like six sigma lean six sigma uh, we have got kaizen which we use even in agile uh, we have the pdca cycle uh, which is called damming cycle it is plan, do, check, and act. This is applicable to any kind of process, not only the project management, any kind of process, whether it is, uh, you see, quality is applicable to not only projects, but even, uh, even you know, operations. So plan, do, check, and act is a process improvement cycle. Then in Agile, we have methods like Scrum, Kanban, Crystal. We have already discussed them. So these all could serve as quality method for continuous improvement. Question, which of the following would not be part of the quality management plan? Quality standards and roles, minimum viable product, 
quality tools to be used, major procedures for dealing with non-conformance. What do you think? Uh, D. D. Minimum viable product is an option. You may or may not have it. And this is only possible in Agile. Therefore, you it is definitely optional, right? It, it doesn't apply to a predictive project. Which two of the following are used by quality management teams to identify issues? Audit reports, planning poker, design for experiments, Cano model. Identifying issues. Audit Can reports. Work. Which one? Audit reports. I didn't get you. A, audit reports. A, audit reports. Yeah, okay, okay. A is all right. And what, the, what is the next one? Um, D, can I... Planning poker is a, is an estimation technique, right? It is not uh, uh, there for identifying issues. Kelvin, what do you think? I don't know what is Cano model, but I know the quality is based on design. Yeah. So yeah. I will go by. It. Yeah. That is the right answer. Design bar experiment, you know, we have to, certain things we are not sure about, we have to do a little exercise, a experiment to prove that the design will work or not. So that experimentation actually serves to identify the issues. And audit reports, naturally, these are the two correct answers. What is the focus of quality assurance and what does it result in? Uh, we have four options. One is correct. Quality assurance is focused on the process and procedure used and it results in improved quality. Okay. B, quality assurance is focused on measuring the output of the work packages and it results in improved quality. Third, quality assurance is focused on measuring the output of the work package and it results in better metrics. D, quality assurance is focused on the process and procedures used and it results in a shorter schedule. What do you say? Remember, quality assurance has nothing to do with the product. It is about processes. So that means B and C are out. So select between A and D. A. A, because it results in improved quality, not in shorter schedule. A project management manager is reviewing the quality control chart with the project team and the product owner. The response trend has been going down over the last few reporting periods, but is still above the upper control limit. You, I, I told you about the control limits or not. Like, you know, the tolerance uh, we have got, the you know, uh, if it is two feet uh, uh, is, the, is the dimension, is the specification, then I said, okay, say 0 0.003 millimeters on the plus side and 0 0.003 millimeter on the negative side. So it could be, um, if the dimension was one meter, then 0.993 uh, millimeter, uh, uh, 0.993 meters is okay with us. Anything, and 1.003 meter is also okay with us. So anything in between 0.993 and 1.003 would be acceptable to the customer. Agreed? So, tell me what does that mean? The project's quality is outside the quality standard set for the project. The project's burn down rate is above normal. Project standards are too high. Project's quality is above expectation. A. Project quality is outside the quality standard set for the project. Okay. Anyone else? Um, I also say A. Mm -hmm. it's the same for me. Option A. Okay, good. A is the correct answer. 
and there we are done with this oh there is one one area left uh, and that is actually there are 10 areas in project management in predictive project management um, uh, one uh, is the parent area of all and that is called integration remaining nine areas are uh, nine knowledge areas are part of the integration so overall project management plan includes all the other management plans, meaning schedule management plan, scope management plan, requirement management plan, quality management plan, all the plans you have studied, they actually come and uh, form the part of the, uh, are integrated together to form part of the overall project management plan. So basically, the role of integrating the plans, the overall, the scope, schedule, budget, resources, quality, everything, that though all those plans are put together, to develop the project management plan. So this is the integrated view of all the plans that can identify and correct the gaps or discrepancies, align efforts and highlight how they depend on each other and help assess and coordinate the project during its life cycle. And it is very important because you see, if you have got something in schedule and there is something in cost and they are not well coordinated with each other, your schedule, your diagrams will not show it in the right manner. If there are any risks in, some part of risk or cost or something that must be clearly linked to that plan. So all the plans have to be properly integrated. And when the whole project management plan is ready, only then we can go for execution. So integration is really very important. And this is good for uh, the predictive because in predictive, we plan everything upfront and naturally at the end of the planning, we integrate everything and combine all the planning results into the knowledge areas and all, and ultimately the project plan is executed. In Agile, we don't do it like that. In Agile, we reframe the approach to plan integration in a way and figure out a way forward to work with the various planning elements, adopt it while working. So we actually do not create a complete project management plan, but we create an outline plan, which is a product roadmap, something like that, and then, we are working in small iteration. That means our project management plan or the outline plan, which we have, is actually uh, grooming over time. That becomes enriched. And as the project comes to the close, your plan would then be definite and complete, right? So uh, we don't have a project management plan as such in the beginning of the project. Uh, we don't start the uh, agile project after the project management plan has been completed. Rather, we start working on Agile as soon as our integration, uh, our you know, iteration start. So adaptive process and Agile ceremonies provide a structure to continuously integrate plans or aspects of our project. So this is our ongoing pro process. Integration in, is ongoing in Agile and hybrid. How do we control change? That is, a, has to be a unified control, which probably is a parent of all other controls. All other knowledge areas can have their own control. There could be a schedule control. There could be a cost control, a quality control. All kinds of controls could be there, but there should be a parent control, and that is called uh, 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 monitor and control project work, which is an integration process. And moreover, if there is a change, change could be suggested in the project by any of the controls. Even the scope control can suggest a change, the schedule can suggest a change, but all these changes have to be submitted to our integration process, which is called integrated change control, which is actually responsible for giving decisions with whether this change has to be accepted or not and how to do it, right? So there are two processes in monitoring and control regarding integration. One is monitor and control project work, which is a parent control process for all other controls. And then any change requests which are being submitted from any of the controls, they come to the second process, integration process, which is called the integrated change control. Right? This is how change control is affected in a predictive project. There is no concept of change control in Agile. Hybrid could have a, you know, hybrid kind of a system which could partially have change control uh, at the higher level, but at lower levels, they will be more uh, like working like Agile. Okay, 
So what could be the questions about change and what are the typical answers? Who can process, propose a change? Anyone. Anyone can propose a change. Any stakeholder, any control uh, from inside or outside, change could be proposed by anyone. What exactly constitutes a change? A change is proposed or an event changes when, when the project baselines are ma made. You see, what is that case for a change? Case for a change is if there is a change to scope, time, cost. The three project objectives, if they are affected, there is a need for a change, right? So change is proposed in that event. And it is always when a project baseline, scope baseline, schedule baseline, or cost baseline, they are disturbed, change is required. What is the impact of change on project objectives? Naturally, we recommend evaluation methods for that. And we see uh, how much are they impacting on the project objective and which are scope, time, and cost. What are steps to evaluate a change request before approving or rejecting? Required steps will be adopted as per the quality policy because all the processes are controlled by that. Who has the authority to approve various types of levels and levels of change? Actually, no, uh, we should have a change control board or a steering committee who actually composes of all the key stakeholders, the sponsor of the project, and uh, all those who are, you know, uh, it's not a big team. It These are not all the stakeholders. These are just the key stakeholders, the big stakeholders and the sponsor, and maybe the project manager could be part of it. But project manager is normally a proposer. He doesn't make decisions. So this they, they are the people who approve it. Uh, in a way, I could say the same group of people who uh, developed the charter are uh, usually in the control board. Okay, when a change request is approved, what project documents will record the next steps? Well, change log will keep a track of that change, that this change, this request has been approved, and now this change has been made, then that will be entered in a change log. Actually, there are two, two documents. One is a change request log, and the other is a change log. Change request log is all the change requests are submitted, they are, uh, <clears throat> they are documented in change request log. And then some of them are approved, some are not. The things which have been approved, they move on to the change log. And then we follow up on those changes, whether they have been properly implemented or not. <clears throat> How will you monitor these actions to confirm completion and quality? That naturally, we have already talked about RAM and RASI charts. In Agile, we talk about the information radiators. These are the instruments through which we confirm the completion and quality. Plan for complexity and change. Uh, system based. Uh, how do you deal with complexity? If there is a very complex thing in front of you, maybe a, a machine in front of you, which is very complex, so you can't understand it, how to fix it, what will you do? You will decouple it. You will break it into uh, small parts and then try to understand the working of each part that is called decoupling or you will try to simulate it you will try to draw it and try to computers do some computer simulation or physical simulation and try to trying to understand how does it work so complex systems are to be dealt like that <clears throat> then another way of doing it is reframe the problem you know uh, if the if the statement I am making to you does not re make real sense to you, you can't understand it, I can reframe or rephrase my problem. So uh, I could take a diversity view. view. Uh, previously, I may be using some technical la language. Now uh, I will try to convert my, my uh, framing into uh, more layman language. I could create a balance reconsidering the type of data used. And it could be process-based, like I can iterate, plan iteratively and incrementally, like in Agile, and then engage, really engage with stakeholders, tell them, bring them on board. And uh, say, fail safe, what, what does it mean? That is also a very interesting concept, plan for failure. Why should you plan for failure? Any ideas?
from your side? It's a part of uh, risk mit mitigation? Like no, no. To... no, actually it is part of agile. Plan for failure is an agile term. Uh, they, they also have some other terms for that. But fail safe is that if there is something uh, risky in front of you and you keep pending that issue, uh, that problem will never go away. Right? So mm -hmm. face the problem where it comes, encounter it, maximum what will happen to you. You will fail. You will learn a lesson out of it. You will iterate and then again engage the stakeholder and then again do it. In other words, you might have heard about try, try again until you win. Is this what the people tend to call contingency plan? Not really. Not really. It's not a contingency okay. plan. It is kind of, as I said, it is uh, try, try again. Don't don't get disappointed by the first failure. You plan for failure. You say, okay, I can fail, no problem. If I fail, I'll learn something and I'll redo it and then redo it until I succeed. That is the mission. That is how the intention goes. That's why you're saying that this is more applicable for a agile no, no, no. It, methodology. It, it is a good methodology for everywhere. But in agile, they have adopted it as a mandatory condition. They say this is what we always do. In predictive, uh, this they acknowledge it, but they don't do it all the time. Kind of it is uh, um, optional for them. They may use this, may, may not use it. There are so many things which are mandatory in Agile, but optional in predictive project. Like servant leadership, like uh, um, self-organizing, self-organization. All these concepts are mandatory in Agile. But they are, uh, you know, optional in predictive project they want to use it they want to benefit they can use it okay how to approach complex plans naturally we have talked about fail soft uh, fail fast and self correct and naturally when we learn from our failure we are self correcting ourselves so naturally this uh, is due to the collaboration uh, we are able to tailor our needs and adapt to the new situation we should have resilience. So all of this. So what is the primary component used for integrating the project management plan? Uh, outputs of the planning processes. When the product will be phased out. When the project will be chartered. Administrative duties of the project manager. So what does our primary component used for integrating the project management plan? What is a part of the project management plan? In other words. But all is the part of project management plan. A, the outputs of the planning processes. Exactly. A is the correct answer because all the management plans being created have to be integrated into the project management plan. Product owner is on vacation. A decision must be made on a project chain. What should the team reference to determine the next steps? Uh, okay, what should they refer to? Charter, change management plan, project timeline or the configuration management plan? One correct answer. Project charter? What? Process? Uh, I know, sorry, the project charter, A? Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, that is the job of the change management plan. Change management plan tells us how to bring changes to your plan. Whenever a decision is made, whenever a approval for a change is given, what steps are to follow? They are written in the change management plan, not in any other plan. But you may be right. No, not Charter is not the right answer. But if you say that, you know, uh, the other management plan, the scope management plan may address how the changes to the scope can come and schedule management plan may address how the changes to the schedule can come. Yes, I tend to agree with that. That could be possible because change management plan is an optional plan if each management plan is not looking after the change management uh, all by itself, then we will have a separate change management plan. Although change management is not a knowledge area. Agreed? Okay. This finally concludes lesson number three. Okay.
here i want to discuss there actually we have got two big lessons not not really that big as this one is uh, like you know uh, 50 to 70% of this uh, this so uh, this took around uh, maybe 9 hours so uh, let's say 6 hours are required for one lesson and 6 hours required for another lesson and for the last lesson i don't give any time this that is so maybe we need 12 more hours to complete this course what do you suggest when can we do that i have some options for you i have got already recorded videos which i can share with you and probably you can benefit from that but then you can't interact or we can mutually decide a good time uh, whenever you all all of you three are available and we can spend those kind of three hour slots for another four more days i'm sorry for that i couldn't cover it but this time is too less to cover everything what do you suggest i think it will be hard for all three of us to find a time that works Um, mm -hmm. just since I have a 12 hour difference from the other two. Um, so I would be happy to watch the videos and then the other two can agree to a time that works. Okay, let me uh, tell you what is my schedule as if you can uh, uh, take care of that. Uh, right. Uh, on Friday and Saturday, I am available. Tomorrow and day after. I am available. And on uh, on Sunday, I will be available in the evening, um, uh, my evening. So let us first decide what is the time at your place right now. Uh, what about you, Fatma? What is the time right now with you? Uh, it's 9.20. 9.20. And that is uh, what what PM. country? PM. Nine twenty PM. And what country is it? New you Zealand. Are... New Zealand. Okay, New Zealand. Oh, and then what is your uh, time, Kelvin? Same New Zealand. Same. same. I'm in New Zealand okay. as well. Okay, so Kelvin and uh, Fatma are from the same. And what about you, Alexandra? It's nine twenty in the morning here for me. Okay, that is AM, right? That and is where, AM, correct. Where are you? In Spain. You are in Spain, right? Good enough. And um, it is my from my time. It is one twenty p.m. Right. Uh, tomorrow, uh, I don't know. What What do you think? Can we uh, spare the same time? Nine, uh, like you know, we have today three hours. Can we do it on Friday and Saturday? Great. I'm not I cannot, available. I cannot tomorrow. I'm Saturday either. Okay, fine. So that is gone. Same, yeah. That is gone, right. Uh, okay, now my problem is that I will be busy in these hours in next month uh, from Monday to Thursday. I'll not be available uh, because I would be conducting another class uh, during this time. Right. So my availability in the next month would be only on Fridays and Saturdays. Can you make some time out of that? Maybe not this Friday and Saturday, maybe later. So maybe if you can spend three hours on one Friday and Saturday and then three hours on one Friday and Saturday, we will have the course complete. You decide it amongst yourself, but which one is OK with you? Like what if we what if we check the videos and we set kind of a one two hour session for you know responding any question or, or that but, that would be great that we may have that would be great I, I I I am very comfortable with that because I don't have to uh, spend so much time on uh, you know uh, doing that so what we can do is we can uh, use um, I will send you the videos you can look at them and read them and understand them. and when you are comfortable maybe after two weeks three weeks i don't mind 
I will send you the whole course, right? Good to put it's good to put a time frame, otherwise the video yeah. will be dead. Well, I so suppose two weeks is okay. And something it has to be something very uncomfortable, something that we are pushed to to, to join the, the call otherwise. Exactly. And what we can do is at the end of it, after two weeks, after two weeks from now, we will have one session, right? Uh, we, we can decide that when we can have that. And then you can ask all the questions you have, not only uh, in the last two lessons, but in a whole of the PM, complete course, right? We can have a session you say, of- you say, you're, saying that, you're saying that the what is pending, it will take around 12 hours, more or less? Yeah, exactly. Not it's, more than uh, that. Two, two weeks, it, it, it's okay. Yeah. So yeah. you you spend your own time at your own will, wish, whenever you're free, you can keep seeing those videos. And not only those videos, you can even see the videos of earlier classes as well. Can we uh, can we schedule or the um, this session in two weeks time? I don't know. Yeah, that is exactly because my you're point. saying from Monday. So you're saying that from Monday to Thursday you're gonna be busy. So is either Fridays, Saturday, or yeah, Sunday. Friday. Friday will suit me very well. Friday will suit me very well, uh, and this is the same time, same time from. Uh, whatever uh, you know, can, I can organize myself for a Friday, uh, Saturday, or Sunday. Is, uh, kind of difficult for me. Uh, not uh, Friday is okay with you or not? For yes. me, I'm um, speaking on, on my behalf. Yes. Yeah. What time? Because um, same time. Uh, same time as today. Um. Because my kids have um, classes, so I don't okay. know if I can change it. Uh, yeah. No, no, no uh, you don't change it. Let's uh, uh, consider another day. What about Saturday? No, Saturday, like, you know, because we all are working. So Saturday, mm. Sunday is um, okay. Off okay. Day, so, like, you know. so we have the only option of Fridays. And yeah. if I look at it. Yeah, Friday I can make it. Okay, fine, fine, fine. The 15, it's okay. Uh, if it, uh, yeah, exactly. I tell you the date. Uh, we did 15 of November. Yeah, 15 of think? November. Yes, 15 of November. We will have a recap session, right? Is you that say, okay with everybody? You say, you say, ladies, you okay with that? Mm -hmm. Alexandra, you okay with it? Yes, that's fine. So Friday, 15th of November, we are having a recap session and I will send today uh, all the videos to you uh, from a previous course. Naturally, we are not conducting it right now. So I will okay. uh, send you the videos from a previous course. I'll send you the whole set, complete set, right? And you can review them and naturally we can then recap. So probably I should close my class today because we I don't want to start the new chapter right now, right? So will it be all right or do you want me to start the next chapter? Okay. Yes, Alexandra? No, I, th I think it'll be better to just watch the videos rather than okay. start because yeah. then we know Wonderful. what we're starting with. Wonderful. So I'll, I'll do that and uh, we will be meeting on 15th of November, same time. Okay. Right? So take care. Um, is a, are, is it we will... this link as well? It's this video, yeah, course, it's this Zoom course. link. Okay. You already have a link to my playlist and all the uh, classes which we conducted, they are they will be available in that. You just go to the same link. You will find all, all the videos till today. Then I'll supply you another link from a previous class and you can uh, see the remaining, you know, things from there. Got it? Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. Take care, and I hope we'll meet on uh, the 15th. Thank you, and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.